And good morning, everybody. Welcome to FSU Coach Live. My name's Tim Backers, joined with a special guest this morning, Buster Hagenbeck. Buster, thanks so much for joining me today. I really appreciate your time. If you would, just give us a little bit of background of your history. Uh, I know you were in the Army for, for many, many years, but also you have a background in coaching as well. Exactly. Yeah, I grew up in Jacksonville, Florida. Uh, played ball here. I uh, went to West Point, played up there. Uh, then I was uh, commissioned as a first, uh, second lieutenant and went to Hawaii for a little over four years, commanded a company out there. And obviously, uh, I had some good luck and did pretty well. So the Army said, uh, why don't we send you to graduate school fully funded and you can go anywhere in the country you want to go. Wow. And so uh, I chose Florida State because had I not gone to West Point, that was my uh, my choice there. And I can tell you, subsequently, my entire family seems like they've all attended Florida State, my kids, grandkids, the whole deal now. So uh, I went there, but part of the provision was upon graduation that I was going to go back to West Point and I had to uh, be an assistant football coach as well. So my dad said, uh, why wait until then? Why don't you go talk to Coach Bowden and see if you can't be a strap hanger, just hang around and learn what you can. So mm -hmm. I, you couldn't do this today, but I, I went over to his <laughs> office. And his secretary <laughs> let me in. I, I went in and he had me sit down next to his desk and I, I gave him the spiel I just gave you. And he started laughing and said, you're a spy from Southern Miss. <laughs> <laughs> what are you talking about, coach? Well, this was January of 19, I guess, 77. And the opening game in September was Florida State at Southern Miss. So he picked up the phone and he called the head coach at Army and said, is this guy legitimate? And he said, yeah, he's going to come coach for me next uh, next year. And so Bobby uh, allowed me to come on board. And uh, that's how I got the coaching gig at Florida State. Hmm. And then uh, talk a little bit about your experiences coaching with Bobby Bowden. And then obviously you, you transferred out of Florida State and went on and had quite an illustrious career in the Army. Well, Bobby brought me on and uh, he really linked me up with Coach Jim Gladden and Bill Sexton, who was a graduate assistant at the time. And so uh, I worked with them, and I coached defensive ends. Willie Jones was one of uh, Scott Warren, another one that you probably don't remember those characters, but they were terrific football players. We also, in those days, freshmen couldn't start. Uh, and so they had a freshman team, and we had to play four every – if you had a freshman team, you had to play four games during the year. So – uh, Coach Gladden headed up that effort, and I joined him along with Billy, and uh, we had two games here at Florida State and two on the road. But during the regular week, uh, we really were kind of the uh, coaching the opposing team, whoever we were going to play that upcoming Saturday. So I learned an awful lot of football from Coach Bowden from that uh, time frame, and he was really into it. It was his second year. His first year, as you may remember, was his only losing year at Florida State when he went five and six. And the year that I came, we went 10 and two. And so my joke with Coach Bowden, who I'm still in touch with, is uh, it took me coming to Florida State to turn his career around. <laughs> <laughs> I take that credit, but uh, I don't really get it and I don't deserve it. <laughs> uh, what, what were some of the things that made him successful trying to turn that around? Uh, you know, going from five and six to 10 and two, you obviously have a plan. You obviously, was it recruiting or was it specific ways that he coached? Um, what did you learn from him? Well, what I learned from him is initially uh, you go with what you got because you have to think about the team that he had. Uh, they had been recruited before he had become coach, and uh, that was important. So he spent an awful lot of time getting uh, to know all of these players very intimately. And mm. Every week he had some of the players over to his house, and I happened to – I had bought my first house here with my family in Killarney Estates and just lived two blocks from him. And he invited me over on a couple of those occasions. And uh, we got to learn uh, the players. And I think that, you know, translated into my career into the Army later on is really getting to know and understand your subordinates and the people that you work with. Uh, he was a master at it. Uh, and he treated uh, everybody individually. And he understood all the weaknesses and strengths that they had. Uh, and he was all inclusive. So, uh he was just a terrific guy to learn from. Mm. Yeah, I think there's there's something to be said there because in the modern in the modern day, a lot of coaches so, are so focused on winning, they tend to just treat athletes as a, a transaction, right? You're you're kind of a a tool for me to get what I need 
rather than a person. And, and I, I know Coach Bowden was definitely a transformational coach and spending time with his players is a great way to show that you care before they go on the field and, and have to sacrifice their bodies and, exactly. and, and, and their time. Um, go ahead. Go ahead. No, I was please. just going to say I, I was uh, honored to be able to watch him grow in his coaching uh, experiences that he had. We stayed in touch with each other, always have. And I can recall even – when I was superintendent at West Point, which is a three-star billet, mm -hmm. uh, and he, of course, was still coaching at uh, Florida State, uh, we would talk to each other several times a year and talk about a number of things, from ha disciplining players, as, just as I would have to do with cadets or soldiers and those kinds of things. So mm -hmm. he went from being a hands-on coach. When I was there, he was very much involved in coaching the quarterbacks to a point where he would stand back, and you know the tower that's out there. The first few years, he never went up on that tower. And ultimately, <laughs> years later, uh, he went up there and stayed there the whole practice just to see what was going on for the most part. Mm -hmm. Now, you went you went from FSU into the Army, uh, spent decades in the Army, and, and you were very successful. What, what kind of leadership qualities do you see crossing between something like the Army, which is very much you do what I tell you, there's there's – not much else. It's my authority versus sports now, which aren't as dictatorial maybe as they used to be, where athletes feel like they need more of um, a democratic approach, so to speak. Uh, what leadership qualities did you did you kind of see crossing over from sports into the army? Well, I learned early on that. Uh everything but in, with regard to relationships, that uh, everything is personal. I really learned mm -hmm. that from my parents. Uh, my dad had mm -hmm. been in the Navy, he was an enlisted guy for 20 years, served in World War II on an aircraft carrier, the Enterprise. Uh, and you have to earn respect. And he did that, mm -hmm. uh, he got that and understood that. And he really loved those uh, uh, non-commissioned officers and officers that treated him individually and personally and the, the folks that he worked with. So uh, that was the first thing that I learned. Uh, then I learned that, uh, and as much from Coach Bowden, is that uh, everybody uh, can have their say, uh, but not necessarily their way. Mm. And so you listen to everybody. You, you have to listen to folks and you have to be open to it. And they know that you're going to uh, air what they have to say and consider it, even if you don't decide in their favor on a particular issue. So it's that interpersonal skills uh, piece that has to be developed. So es essentially taking in the opinions of everybody before making a decision so that everybody knows that they've been heard exactly. as opposed to you just, this is what we're going to do. Yeah. And, I, and the higher I rose in rank, uh, the more and more I tried to decentralize decision-making and just have the most critical questions uh, and issues come to, to me for a decision. I mean, I wanted to know what was going on at all times below me, uh, but I didn't want to micromanage anything mm. if I could avoid mm. it. Well, micromanaging also creates a, a lot of time consumption as well because you spend your your day in the weeds as opposed to what you should be doing as a, as a leader, the, the higher level thinking, so to speak. Absolutely. So uh, in, in your bio, you were featured in a book which was called No Fear of Failure, Real Stories of How Leaders Deal with Risk and Change. And, and I wanted to ask you about that because in, in coaching and, and in leadership, a lot of us have leadership positions, even if it's not in sports specifically, we have risk and a lot of times change is difficult. How, how do you go in and uh, work on changing a culture um, that may not want change or that may not want to take chances? We, we can see the, this is how we've always done it. Um, that's not how we do things here, attitude. What strategies have you found that work going in and saying, okay, we want to try, let's try something new? Well, there's two aspects of that with my uh, army career. One was uh, in combat and one, of course, uh, in, in peacetime that I can cite. Uh, I took the initial uh, soldiers uh, into Afghanistan just a few weeks after 9-11. Uh, everyone thought that the fight it was basically over with by Christmas time. So September to December, and we we're pretty much done, kind of planning a, a return. And uh, I got a call from Secretary Rumsfeld. Mm -hmm. He said, start making plans, but we're going to leave you there till June. 
And then the middle of February, we got a call from like the uh, chief of staff of the army who came back and said, we've got some intel that there's some really bad guys along uh, high ridge lines at 10,000 feet uh, between Afghanistan and Pakistan, uh, Al Qaeda, and you need to go take them out. That was the only instruction and guidance that I got at that point, which is very unusual in the army. You know, you talk about micromanager or what, but you really start with a mission statement and the, what the situation looks like, what your assets are and how you're going to accomplish that. Mm -hmm. So that uh, aspect of it was that we had to develop a plan. We had about two weeks. We were told that we had to attack uh, by the 1st of March at the very latest. And I was getting some advice from the vice chief of staff of the army. We made the plans. Uh, we had to do a helicopter assault into the uh, this uh, valley, like I say, at 10,000 feet. And the weather was miserable. It was snowing every night and it was uh, warming up and melting the snow in the daytime. Mm -hmm. So we went in with a plan, and as soon as we got in there, we had a helicopter shot down, and the uh, plan, uh, all the plans changed immediately. So what we had been working on and wargaming literally uh, for two weeks fell apart, and so we had to uh, to make changes on the fly, and we did that, and I depended on the people on the ground to help do it, uh, and I made the big changes, but I could only really support at that point with uh, air support and logistics. And what we thought would be a three-day fight went on for the better part of two weeks. And we ended up, what we thought we were going to fight, 150 uh, Al-Qaeda to uh, ended up killing over a 1,000 of them. So uh, <clears throat> I pushed down decisions to the lowest ranks when I could, and I only interceded when I needed to. Mm. Fast forward to becoming superintendent at West Point. I had been there uh, in a previous assignment, coaching and doing other things, and I knew some things that probably needed to be changed. But rather than going in and, and dictating that these are the changes that need to be made, I created what in those days were called Tiger Teams. And I put together six or eight of them. And they consisted of students, uh, staff and faculty, um, some of the civilian uh, folks that worked up there. And I had them over a period of uh, days, this was in the summertime, uh, develop what they thought uh, were the biggest problems at West Point. And we came up with about 20. We whittled it down to six or seven, worked those teams off and on throughout the fall semester. And uh, by the first of the year, uh, kind of settled on what the changes ought to be and to be introduced uh, after the spring semester had concluded at West Point. The point being was uh, that everybody had their say. The people that were on the team would go back to their apartments. If somebody that headed up the English department or somebody that was uh, – you know, uh, was in the PE department and they all came back, but they had inputs from their friends and contemporaries. And mm -hmm. so it was like uh, a large part of that community had input into the changes that were being made. And uh, it all turned out uh, very nicely. But again, uh, rather than being di dictated by me, uh, I worked my way through that year and uh, they came up with the right solutions. So it was, it was a, a, a very much a we approach rather than an I approach. Well said, yes. Okay. Um, you've obviously been in, in a lot of leadership positions and been in some very pressure, uh, intense situations. And, and you talked about some of those. How did you deal with pressure? Did you have any specific strategies? Did you, um, for example, exercise, um, stress relief? Uh, or, or did you have any psychological strategies you used just to control the pressure of it's all on you? And if this goes wrong, they're coming looking for you. That's quite an intense environment to be in, being in charge of, of such a large group of people to do such an important um, uh, thing. Well, yeah, I've, I've always been big on uh, physical fitness. I mean, I grew up that way. And, of course, it was uh, emphasized in the Army early on, continued to there at Florida State and, uh, and what I got my degree in. So in almost every circumstance that I've uh, been a part of, I've been able to exercise virtually every single day. And it uh, would vary from uh, running a number of miles every day. I ran a marathon or two back in the days and uh, getting to the gym uh, two or three times a week and being able to do that. The other part that I learned was to get into a routine. Uh, I try to go to bed at the same time every night when I could and get up at the same time in the morning. Mm -hmm. uh, and that proved useful. When I was in a combat situation, I typically would go to bed at uh, midnight and get up at four. Now, that doesn't sound like much sleep, uh, but you only had to do that for a couple of weeks at a time as long as that one engagement was ongoing that you could do. I also kept a, a journal for about 10 years. I started it 
literally uh, in Afghanistan. And it's interesting because I've got it now. And I look back on it. And that was, I think, a release, a mental release. I would sit down and, and take 15 or 20 minutes over a cup of coffee when I first got up or just before I went to bed uh, and write down my thoughts as well. So in fact, it, to be honest with you, I'd not looked at that thing until just the last couple of weeks when uh, somebody wanted to interview me uh, about operations in Afghanistan. So I, I'm curious, is that going to be a, a book down the road? Is that something you have aspirations well, for? Well, I've been asked to do that. I, I've got a guy in mind. He's a best-selling author that I'm, I'm trying to convince to uh, to co-author it with me. To this point, I haven't convinced him. So uh, I'd like to think I could write, but I'd, I'd like to defer it and have If you know somebody out there that would like to co-author a book, uh, have them contact me. Okay. Um, going back to, to coaching and, and leadership, when when we think of the the millions of coaches out there, a lot of them lack sufficient training. A lot of them come in very green in the sense that this is how my coach taught me, and this is what I've seen from coaches. What advice do you have for for coaches that are kind of coming into the field and are, are trying to improve and and trying to move up the ranks? Hopefully, they can find a mentor to help them out. I didn't think in those terms when I went there to Florida State, but I have to, again, give great credit to Jim Gladden, uh, who took me under his wing. Um, we spent a lot of time together, uh, both on and off the field. And uh, he just, he helped me along and, and gave me some insights that would have taken me years to learn independently. So I think that's the best thing that you could do. And then and stand back also and watch other people uh, and how they react to situations and deal with uh, really uh, the, the tough issues. Mm. Did you do any self-reflection in, in your career and looking back, because I know the army is so structured that, you know, there is a, a very strict hierarchy, but at times do you kind of pull back and take a look at how am I doing and what can I improve? Uh, yes. In fact, uh, the army has a, it, I don't know if they still do it since I've retired, but uh, they used to have what we call off sites and commanders okay. would have them with their subordinates, with their staff in particularly. And you'd spend a day or two together uh, and look at that uh, issues as a group and how you can reflect on things and mistakes that you've made. Uh, and you learn your, uh, I learned more about my weaknesses and my strengths. I kind of knew those already, but uh, my biggest weakness that I had, and I don't know that I ever really overcame it, was uh, I had great difficulty uh, firing anybody or, or moving them out of a job. Uh, I don't know what caused all those issues. I mean, I can recall specifically what the, the people that I had to deal with, but uh, sometimes I left a few people in jobs longer than they should have been hmm. to the detriment of the organization. When we, uh, the last question I really have is, is one about ethics and your philosophy, because in, in many situations we experience, whether it be sports or, or, you know, the army or, or anything involving leadership, we have to make decisions that uh, walk a fine line between doing the right thing and maybe doing the wrong thing with good motives or good intentions. Can you give an example or two of maybe where you've had to make those decisions and what guided you in making sure that you made the right decision? Yeah, I've had to do that more than a few times and, and, and mm -hmm. you're absolutely right. Uh, I mean, uh, the honor aspect and doing what's right is absolutely critical because that's what your reputation uh, resides on. I mean, it rests on that. And once you break that, uh, I don't think you can ever regain it. Uh, one of my toughest decisions, uh, I was superintendent at West Point, a, uh, a great baseball player on our at, at Army at that time had been uh, brought in for what we call honor, that he had uh, plagiarized uh, a paper that he had to write uh, and submitted it. And at those points, our, the Army had just changed the rules. And he, up until that point, any cadet that got, quote, what we call found on honor by his peers, the cadets, uh, <clears throat> had to be approved by the superintendent, but was automatically kicked out and uh, went into the Army as a private. And this happened with this youngster, and the rules had changed. And I brought him into my office and uh, the people in his what we call chain of command had said that he was hands down the best cadet that they had ever seen in their careers. Not just that year, but since he'd been around, he was a, the epitome of what we wanted cadets to do. Anyway, to make a long story short, uh, he appealed to me uh, to stay in. And so what I did was uh, 
I sent him away and it took me a couple of days to work my way through it and talking to some senior officers. And I put him in the army uh, initially for 12 months. Uh, and then he came back to West Point uh, as a junior again and was not allowed to play baseball, even though he was a, an all-star, if you will. I took uh, a great deal of heat from a number of cadets for the longest time. And it was an issue that uh, in my remaining time as superintendent, I would address uh, each spring with each of the classes there at West Point. Uh, the point being is uh, this young man had come clean about the mistake that he had made. Mm. Uh, when he came back, one of the things before I allowed him to come back after that year in the Army was his battalion commander, which is a lieutenant colonel, had to write me a letter on that and give me a letter of recommendation. Uh, and this officer did that. He was not a West Point graduate and basically said he's the best lieutenant I've ever seen in my career. And he's everybody looks to him as an example. And they want to be like him. And so I, I feel like in my heart, I made the right decision uh, for him. And uh, ultimately, most of the cadets came over to seeing it the same way that I did. But uh, it all hinged on the notion you just described about honor and ethics and how important that plays in the leadership role. Mm -hmm. And making a decision like that, you you have the responsibility of you've set a precedent where exactly. this has happened. Now, what happens if it if it occurs again? Can I be consistent with my decision making? Right. Um, so it's great to see you gave him another chance and that he actually honored that by by making sure he took it as opposed to, you know, abusing that opportunity, yes. so to speak. Um well, Buster, thank you so much for, for joining me. I appreciate it very, very much. And, and I hope that those who are watching now and, and watching the future will, will take some, some knowledge away. I know I have. If somebody who does want to reach out to you with questions, what's the best way that they can do that? Uh, just contact me by email. I think that's be ideal. You've got my email address. Can you share that, Will? Oh, there you go. It is. It's up there for you. And so just take a screenshot or, or write that down real quickly, and we'll make sure that that uh, it gets to him. And then also just a reminder that tomorrow we have a head coach of women's soccer at St. Leo University, Dr. Peter McGahee. will be talking about his experiences coaching. He's coached at multiple places around the country. And then the rest of the week, we have Al Light, the head coach and performance specialist at Cirque du Soleil. I'm very interested to see how Cirque du Soleil training differs from an athletic environment. And then we round out the week with Jennifer Hyde, who is the head coach of women's tennis at Florida State. She'll be talking about her experiences as well. Well, Buster, thanks again very much for, for joining me. And um, I hope people do reach out with questions. Thanks so much, Tim. It's great being with you. And I applaud you for what you're doing. you got a great lineup coming up. Thank you.